Yeah, so, okay. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Aya al -Bitar. I'm a PGY3, I think I would know most of you. Um, and uh, yeah, I will be talking today about thrombocytopenia, so I'm interested in hematology and oncology. So we, whenever you're ready, I can start. I, I just so you know that, um... I don't know if you have the chat up, if you want us to, uh, we'll be monitoring the chat and we'll, uh, if the opportunity arises, we may pause up certain moments okay. to go through questions as they come up. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone for the chair up. <laughs> okay, so we'll be talking about thrombocytopenia. I will start with my outlines and let's see, so it's not moving. Okay, here we go. Okay, so uh, the way that we will be doing this presentation today is um, we, I'm just gonna go over a few questions or just a paragraph and say if this is a myth in fact, and uh, I would need a pull for this. So whenever I have my uh, paragraph and um, if you don't mind having a pull for me and uh, uh, you guys would answer if it's a fact or myth based on your information and then we'll go over some data regarding that uh, topic. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to go over my outlines now. So I'm just going to touch base on the most common causes of and etiology of thrombocytopenia, approach to thrombocytopenia diagnosis. We'll focus on ITP in this talk, and we'll talk about workup, primary versus secondary or uh, drug-induced ITP, treatment guidelines, whether it's initially for initial ITP or refractory, and we'll touch base on trans platelet transfusion threshold. So my first question is, most common cause of thrombocytopenia is ITP. Is this a myth or a fact? Can we have a poll? Great. Thank you. We'll say A is myth, right? Okay, awesome. <laughs> A is myth, B is fact. Okay, great. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, ITP is not okay. Okay, ITP. This is a myth, as everyone or most people said. Uh, so ITP is not most common cause of thrombocytopenia, and uh, the easy way to think about thrombocytopenia is uh, depending on what setting we're actually seeing our patients. So in the outpatient setting, you may see more ITP or drug-induced ITP, but for most of the folks that we see inpatient um, or ICU patient or sick patients, it can uh, be related to infections. Drug-induced thrombocytopenia is very common in the hospital. Uh, we see DIC more frequently than that you would see outside the hospital. Uh, and we see a lot of actually pseudo, th uh, th uh, pseudo thrombocytopenia. And and uh, I want to highlight that uh, GP2P3A inhibitors and in cardiac patient can also ca cause thrombocytopenia. So this is for our patient population, but actually the most common cause of thrombocytopenia is uh, a gestational thrombocytopenia. It's actually 70% and preeclampsia. So really a majority of thrombocytopenia are seen in uh, patient in uh, pregnant women. Uh, and it's ITP is 3%. Drug induced is pretty common. So, so yes, I think everyone got it. Most people got it right. That's good. Uh, so I'll move on to the next myth or fact question. And this is a patient in the ICU recovering from a septic shock, and you see he's clinically improving. And day seven, you play, his platelet count dropped suddenly to 50, his INR of one. Uh, your top differential diagnosis in this ICU patient is DIC. Is this a myth or a fact? Do we have the answer? I don't think I see the result. We've got A with 81% and B with 19%. Okay, A with 80? Okay. 81, yeah. 
81. Okay, cool. Uh, okay, so yes, again, most people got it right. So this is a myth. And uh, basically just seeing this patient clinically doing better and INR of one. So it's less likely that he's going through DIC at this time of point. Then why is his platelet has dropped? And there's a couple of reasons that it's helpful to think about uh, initially. And I want to go over this. So um, so when you have someone with platelet count dropping just suddenly and they're doing well clinically, they're not bleeding, you're not really thinking of something scary such as HIT or TTP, um, or, or basically in people who are doing well, you should not be thinking about these things just right away. It should be in your mind somewhere. So it's like a not miss type of uh, diagnosis, but um, not the first thing. So first you want to confirm that these this patient is actually having thrombocytopenia before you send more extensive or expensive workup, such as your DIC or HIT panel. Because uh, artificial thrombocytopenia, or also called pseudo, uh, pseudo, pseudo uh, thrombocytopenia, is common and lab errors always exist. So, how you look for that? So, this is an interesting thing. So, when we send a lab, there is a purple tube and blue tube. Uh, and uh, the purple one used the EDTA as the anticoagulants in it, and this can can actually cause a clumping in the platelets, so they you will get a pseudo low platelets. And to avoid this in these patients, and the, the reason why this happened, uh, I'll go over it in a second. But to avoid this in this patient, you basically avoid uh, avoid using this purple top and 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 use the blue one. The blue one uses citrate, which does which as an anticoagulant, which does not cause this problem. And uh, so this is to confirm this is true. I should have used this earlier. And then this is what happened. Basically, the body in some people can produce antibodies, anti-GP2B3A, against the GP2B3A and the platelets and change the shape of the platelets, and that would um, cause it to uh, clump together. So for these patients, remember that you need to, to send blue top. And why does this happen? I'm not sure in certain patients, not everyone, but uh, it's uh, something to be aware of. So now let's say our patient uh, does not have, does not have a uh, pseudothrombocytopenia. It's an actual true thrombocytopenia. So we are, I'm just going to spend this sometimes on this slide because it's helpful. So we said in this patient, we did not see platelet clumping. And if you want to see how platelet clumping looks like, it's over here. So like a lot of platelets coming together under this scope. Uh, and that's artificial. So we're not here. So we're talking about true thrombocytopenia here. And there is a couple ways of approaching it. I'm just going to go over the microscopic way because we're trying to brace how important to look under the scope, the scope and see what exactly is going on in a plot smear. So it's a true thrombocytopenia. And uh, you will, if you if you see schistocytes like these fragmented uh, RBCs, then you at that time you're worried about TTP, HUS, DIC, and you're just going all the way ordering these panels. Uh, if you don't see this and you see BLATs, which I think everyone on the have done hemonc service have heard have heard of BLATs uh, or numbers of BLATs. So BLATs are just a giant cell that you see. It says that the bone marrow is just pushing big or cells. And uh, if you see that, then you're thinking about bone marrow disorders and you're just going a whole different direction. So the thrombocytopenia is just a manifestation of that. Now let's say you see, um, you see micro uh, microsterocytes and RBC is just clumping together. So that can be actually uh, what we call Evans syndrome, which is an autoimmune hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia. So there is an autoimmune process, but it's not it's not the ITP process. It's a, in a hemolytic anemia perspective and it had different workup. And uh, let's say under the scope, you look and you see uh, this toxic granulated lymphocytes and your patient who you know is recovering from infection, then this is infection in the patient who's recovering. So you you know, this is like an uh, infection related. Usually it's in the acute phase of the infection. So you're like looking for an infection causes you may have not diagnosed yet. Uh, and and if, if you just see isolated thrombocytopenia, so this is where you would be uh, looking for, uh, you'll be thinking, oh, this is some sort of thrombocytopenia. I need to know if it's ITP, if it's drug related or related to other infections that don't direct that, 
is playing in the background, such as HIV, Hep C, H. pylori. Um, the IC can go here. It plays different ways. And, uh, and then you will investigate further for these reasons. So I just added this slide to talk about uh, the way we've been taught, which is also correct and sometimes helpful to do it in the words. You're thinking, is this a production problem? Is my bone marrow not, not making enough platelets? And that's why you're, again, thinking bone marrow. It, and then, or is this a destruction problem? So the platelets are made, they're in the bloodstream, but something is killing them. And what is that? Or this spleen sequestration. So the spleen is overeating your platelet or dilutional, which we see in cardiac patients. And your blood, you have so much volume. So your platelet is just in there um, or like less than the amount you would see in there. This is also a helpful approach in the words, I would say. Uh, but remember, it's helpful to look at the images, I, I guess. So uh, I'm just going to leave this slide now. Let's enough time on it. And move to our next uh, myth and fact question. So immature platelet fracture, fraction is not needed in diagnosing ITP. Is this a myth or fact? Myth is A and fact is B. Okay, good. So, yes, so this is a fact. Uh, so immature platelet fracture uh, is actually something that is not very recently, but is available at UW since uh, 2020. Uh, it's not used very frequently from hematologists. And the reason why it's basically similar to what we look when we look for reticular size in RBCs, you're basically looking at these small babies still platelets that still have their nucleated acids uh, within them. Uh, and this is what you identify. It's not usually reliable below in platelet count below 10, and it can it can vary. It, it can vary a lot. So although some people have said it's important to check an ITP, um, that what we know so far is particularly high in TTP, it's high in ITP, but there is no specific range that we, we know that we should be looking for. And other other thing may elevate this um, platelet, uh, platelet number, uh, sorry, pl uh, immature platelets. Uh, so I don't think we should hang our hat a lot on, uh, and, on implying this uh, in ITP patients. Uh, and most hematologists do, don't use it. Sometimes it's sent before like the patient, hematologists are consulted and they're like, oh, why did you send this lab? Um, yeah. So we're moving, um, uh, so moving on to the next Myth and fact question. So all patients with a new ITP diagnosis need to be tested for H. pylori. Is this a myth or a fact? Okay, so I, I like this. I see 60-40, and uh, we'll go over the data for this. I actually did not know about H. pylori testing and ITP until I was preparing this talk. So this is a myth, actually, uh, and we'll go over why. Um, so it's part of the recommendation that you test people for H. pylori, but not everyone needs to be tested. The, recommend, the current recommendation or ASH guidelines is you test people who are within... Um, and a, a regional or geographic region that you know have high prevalence of H. pylori. So it's not a unified test for everyone. Uh, and the uh, basically the evidence behind this testing came from this systematic review that looked at 25 study and they had around 700 patients who had ITP with H. pylori. And then they eradicated ITP, and uh, sorry, they eradicated H. pylori in different ways. And they noticed that there is an increase in platelet count. Overall, there was around 50% of the people had uh, had an increase of the, their platelet count more than 30, and their platelet count went to above 30. So 
so their conclusion was that H. pylori education may be useful treatment in, in ITP. So again, in your patient who has regional demographic for H. pylori, very important to test them, you might help their, uh, their ITP. And if someone is not responding to treatment and you're looking for other causes and you have not sent this yet, so it's also helpful to you know get it done and see if that's playing a role why they're not responding. Okay, so next slide. So here I'm just get, I'm, I just mentioned the primary and secondary causes of ITP. So the primary ITP is our typical ITP that we most usually refer to. It's acquired, it's immune mediated. Uh, it's between two processes: the destruction and uh, underproduction of platelets. Your secondary ITP is something that's associated with other another disease or another etiology that's going on, such as connective tissue diseases (SLE) and others. Uh, Drug-induced immune thrombocytopenia. I used to think it goes under secondary ITP, but it's actually, in fact, like a, another category. And it's what we probably see more common in wars, which is related to drugs. It's uh, antibodies that would the body would uh, secrete against platelets um, after being exposed to certain medications. We usually see it, I've seen it most often with antibiotics. Um, and with that, uh, I want to talk a little bit about diagnostic studies for primary ITP. And here we're talking about primary ITP. Basically, your first goal when you're trying to diagnose primary ITP, we call it diagnosis of exclusion. So your first goal is to rule out other causes for secondary ITP. So you take a very uh, comprehensive history and physical exam. You would start with basic lab, uh, your CBC, you look at peripheral blood. And here comes the helicobacter valerie that we were talking about. And again, it's regional. Uh, you test for HBV, and this is actually important, very important for us internists, because before, if this patient needs rituximab, it's very important to have them tested for HBV, um, so you don't activate their hiding H H uh, HBV. You also test for HIV, HCV, because they can they can be related to secondary causes. Uh, you do check quantitative immunoglobulin, and that's actually to rule out other immune deficiencies such as CVID, and also before you need to give it, do it before you do IVIG. So it's actually, I feel like it can come frequently in the words. You'll have a patient, you, they have gotten IVIG since they got there, and then next day you're trying to work them up and you're sending your quantitative immunoglobulin. You need to be careful to send it of the top that sent that was drawn before the patient received IVIG rather than stop that sent after they received it because the IVIG would actually mess up all your results. So it would be like a useless it's a useless test that you send. And this actually happens very frequently. Um, GIT, you send it throughout evidence, as we said, um, uh, it, it will be have hemolytic anemia as a component. And uh, I, I just actually found, I found it a fun fact. Some people do imaging uh, to look for the spleen. You're basically looking at people spleen side. And uh, you may need to do bone marrow. Usually it's not, not bone marrow is not needed in an initial diagnosis, but if your patient is showing symptoms of, of other underlying bone marrow disease or they're not responding to the treatment you're giving, then you can get a bone marrow biopsy. Well, the word biopsy is not I, I can I ask a question since uh, you know so much about this? What is the, how does H. pylori What's the putative cause connection to ITP? Uh, you know, I'm actually not quite sure about okay. the specific association, but I would say it will have to do with antibody, like antibody mediated in a way, the basic trigger, but similar to other infections. Okay. That's a very good question. Okay, let's see. We're here. Okay, so this is another myth and fact question. So we have a 40 years old female with ITP stable in her therapy and comes to you, her PCP and asks you, uh, I'm worried about an ITP flare if I get the COVID vaccine, right? COVID has to be there somewhere. So this is a myth or a fact. Okay, 
So we almost have the equal answers for both myth and fact. And I think that's fair because it's a very hard question to sort out. So this is actually a myth. And I would refer to the study that um, can be helpful to guide you through entering this question. Uh, however, as we all know, with COVID, there's always data coming up and things that, uh, you know, people have different opinions. So always be cautious and looking at what's like the most recent data on this. But currently, uh, we have this study that was done uh, and it looked at the risk of ITP exacerbation patient and ITP patient after they got their COVID vaccine. It was a prospective study and was observ uh, observational. It looked at, at, 200 pa at uh, 218 patients with ITP and compared them to 200 patients as a healthy control group. Uh, so they used a healthy control group, just keep this in mind. They did not use an other, other ITP patients. And this, that was, this study was done. Basically, they checked people platelet count before they gave them the vaccine and they gave them the vaccine and then they followed them after one week and four weeks. That's for the ITP patient versus for the healthy patient, they only looked at their platelet count in four weeks. And what they saw in their study, basically for, and here you can see in this uh, background, the, uh, the red line refers to the ITP patients versus the blue one is for the healthy patients. And you have the duration in weeks and the X uh, axis and the Y axis, the platelet counts. So you can see your ITP patient actually started at the lower platelet count of 100 or around 100 and the healthy patient started at two, around 250. So uh, overall, there was steady but very slight decrease in both groups. So there was not a more drop or significant drop in the ITP patient in terms of platelet counts. So these uh these no this this vary depending on um, so when basically when they looked at the sub-analysis of patient with ITP, so they re realized that um that uh, the ITP duration uh, varies in uh, has an effect, and uh, and when the drop happened was also kind of different. And if patient is a current uh, if patient is a current treatment, uh, it also also has a lower rate of uh, of uh, of having drop in their platelet. And if they have splenectomy, that also. Uh, has an effect. So basically the conclusion and the study, I would say is not like perfectly designed in my opinion, but uh, their conclusion, basically they noted ITP exacerbation in, of thir in, of uh, 13 point in, uh, point 0.8 in all patient. And that goes into two category, more than 50% decline in platelet count versus baseline or 20% decline platelet count plus platelet uh, count less than 30. Uh, and they look at the patient who received rescue medication. So their conclusion from the study is, um, is basically, I, basically using the vaccine is safe in, safe in ITP patient, but you need to be careful to these subset of ITP patients. So if your patient is a young patient or currently needing treatment for their ITP, or they have a baseline platelet count less than 50, then these patients are at a higher risk of uh, needing rescue treatment or having an exacerbation. Uh, and um, yeah, so overall, uh, the consideration, this is overall a COVID vaccine is overall safe, similar to other vaccines. So there's, there's also some association of dropping platelets between other vaccines and uh, and ITP. Um, so I don't know if that was not super clear, but <laughs> but basically the the main idea is it's safe. Uh, it will drop your. It will may cause exacerbation, but mainly in subset of patients. And uh, with that, I'll move to the next one. Okay, so the next myth and fact question is basically you have an asymptomatic and asymptomatic patients with the new diagnosis of ITP and their platelet counts are less than 20. Uh, these patients need hospitalization for their management. Is this a myth or a fact? Okay. So this is actually um okay, so we have almost 60% for a myth and uh 35, I guess, for a fact. 
And uh, so this is actually a fact and I'll go over the guidelines. So basically the ASH guidelines recommend that for newly diagnosed patient with ITP, and it's very important to remember new diagnosis of ITP, these patients rec uh, recommended to be treated inpatient if their platelets are less than 20, even if they're asymptomatic or not having a major bleed. Uh, so you just admit them, see how they respond to treatment and plug them into, plug them into uh, to therapy. And uh, another important thing to do for these newly diagnosed patients is just to assess their bleeding or risk of bleeding, if they need platelet transfusion, if they're actively bleeding, or other antifibrolytic therapies. So um, this is a bit of a busy slide, and this is taken from up to date. And I think it's a very helpful to go over this diagram. And uh, basically, really quickly, because some of it we have already covered. So uh, you do your clinical assessment, see if they're bleeding, not bleeding, because if they're bleeding, then you go through a whole different pathway, which is treating as emergency type of thing. If they're not bleeding, but they just have a low platelet count, you know, you you think they have ITP, then you look at their platelet count. And again, if their platelet counts are less than 20, then um, uh, then your initial therapy, and it's pretty universal, it's steroids or IVIG uh, for these patients. And then you look for improvement. If they don't improve, then you look for your, you go for your other second line therapy. And I want to say this is not very comprehensive, but it just highlights the main mechanism of the medications we have available right now, which is the rituximab, the TPO mimetics, uh, splenectomy, and others. And there's ongoing therapies. Um and with that, you basically, again, 20, 20 is your cutoff and a comment on the steroids use. You usually, you, usually the response rate is around 70% of people respond to steroids and it's pretty quick. So if your patient is responding to corticosteroids or not, you will see this within like one to two days and it can last to 14 days. Um, your IVIG, uh, you, usually you don't always need to give it with the steroids if your steroids is working, but if you need something to work faster or they're having some response, but not enough response, you can also give it. There is an 80 to 90% response rate, and it also takes one to three days to have a response. Very important to remember as an internist that we don't want to keep, keep our uh, ITP patients on prolonged steroids course. So if they're needing a steroids course of six weeks or a long one or above six weeks, let's say, then you need to consider alternative options. Uh, there's a lot of people who would stay on like this long, long, prolonged tape, uh, steroid dose and have complications from that. So with that, I'm going to move on to the next, next one. So you have a patient with ITP, refractory to two lines of therapy, which means they have already got through two lines. Uh, and that's within their first, first six months of diagnosis. Should you offer these patients splenectomy? Is this a, or you should offer this, these patients splenectomy. Is this a myth or a fact? Okay, so we have 30% for a myth and 70% for a fact, and we'll go uh, over some data about it. Um, so this is actually a myth, and uh, and I kind of asked Dr. Keel, one of the hematologists, about this uh, a little bit more. So basically, splenectomy uh, definitely not being offered within the first 12 months, and it's most likely not uh, offered uh, after that either these days. And the reason is because we have so many treatment options that we rarely, rarely, very rarely need to reach out to splenectomy given its uh, other complications. And as um, and with that, I'm just going to touch base a little bit about ref on refractory ITP uh, and go over some um, some uh, definitions. So when we say refractory ITP, refractory ITP is not very unifiedly defined. So use, people may use it for different uh, in different terms. Uh, but basically, it's for patients who do not respond for two treatment line. So uh, before I talk about the treatment option for refractory, I want to talk about uh, uh, 
uh, the reason. So 50% of, uh, uh, 50, 50 of patient refractory cases can be related to other to other causes. And that's, uh, so your 50% of your patient may actually not have primary ITP and have something else. So when you're having refractory case, patient not responding to treatment, then maybe think of other etiologies going on or playing in the background for their non-response. Non uh, and uh, terms that you will be hearing, you'll hear refractory ITP, you'll hear relapse in ITP, and you'll hear excessor patient. So what I have pinned out, and again, they can be used interchangeably. So uh, make sure you know what the person is meaning. But refractory, basically, they're not responding. You've treated them with something and they're not responding. You have to go through another line of therapy. Relapse, that means that your patient have responded to something, but then but then they uh, they had another flare or the count dropped again and you have to treat them again. Uh, accessory patient, they have some sort of chronic disease, but then suddenly they drop their count further. So these are three terms that are helpful to kind of keep in mind and that you will be hearing. And uh, uh, yeah, so I'm gonna go over this diagram, which I think actually very fascinating uh, to look at, but may take a bit of a minute. So basically that described when ITP was first diagnosed and the treatment lines over a uh, period of time. So it was first it was first described in 1735 and uh, by uh, the Paul Galtip. And after that, you see between 179 and kind of nine and kind of uh 1950, nothing really not a lot has happened. In 1916, they tried splenectomy and they thought they realized that patient who has splenectomy actually have improved in their platelet counts or don't have bleeding. So splenectomy was kind of the was kind of the um guidelines or the way to go. And then in the 1950, they established the etiology of ITP as an autoimmune blood disorder. And that was uh, Har uh, Dr. Harrington, who was a fellow at that time. And he basically, what he did, he has a patient who had splenectomy and her, her, her account number kept dropping. And what he did, that patient has his same blood type. So what he did, he basically took the patient blood and injected himself with it and noticed that his platelet count dropped after and then a couple of days after you know went back up again and then they did a study on eight people who all have the same drop in their platelet and then went up again and the reason why it goes up basically you're getting antibody and the antibody is going are going away your body is not producing them you're just using someone else's antibody uh and then then in the 1980 this is when the first guidelines for the steroids use was published and it was mainly basically you can use itp you can use uh, steroids or ivig and the reasoning probably because it worked for all autoimmune disease then you try it on anything that's autoimmune um and then, and then not until uh, 2001, when rituximab was trialed in ITP, and it worked. So rituximab come with a lot of price in terms of um, in terms of uh, side effects. So uh, it was not an ideal option, but definitely added up to uh, you know improve this patient quality of life. Uh, and then, and then uh, you can see thrombo thrombo uh, thrombopoietics was first. It was first described in the 90s, and then not until the two until 2008. Sorry, I need to do this. Okay, not until 2008 when we had the first thrombopoietic or TPOA mimetics uh, drug, thrombiplostum. It was it was an it's an IV drug, so that can be a uh, caveat for some people, but it's definitely added up to uh, remission rates in these patients. And then since then, more drugs would, was it were introduced, including TPO mimetics and drugs that have different etiologies. And um, with that, I'm gonna have this busy slide, so get ready, everyone. Don't get scared. Uh, so in this slide, I'm just gonna go over how this relates to ITP really, okay? So as we talk, ITP production destruction problem, uh, so when we're applying this in the normal physiology, so the normal physiology, your liver would produce the TPOA, the TPO, and, and it will go to the bone marrow and induce the megakaryocytes to produce IT, to, to produce platelets. Platelets then will go to the blood and in the blood, basically in the blood smear, live there for, uh, for six to eight days and then they were consumed by the spleen. So this is how it regularly work and your body, you know, living with it. And then what happened in ITP, you're having antibody that's developed at, against a certain protein on the megakaryocytes as well as the platelets and affecting both the production, the production um, uh, pathway and, and the 
platelet left left in the bloodstream. And when that happened, uh, you end up with low platelet. Uh, if ITP is a process, you, you basically have ITP. Uh, the way that folks have approached this over the years, they start by splenectomy. You get the splenectomy, you, you, you cutting what, what's eating your platelets. So, uh, so basically expanding the span of your platelets. You're not solving the problem. Uh, the 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 other ways to do it is basically as auto any autoimmune disease with antibody you can play with steroids and uh, IVIG here, and um and that works for some, some patients. But then came the TPO memetics where basically said let's induce this mega karyocyte to produce a lot of platelets, and that has worked. Although in my mind conceptually it should not really work if the problem is production. How can you really reinduce it? But it does work. Uh, so there is a bunch of these options. And nowadays, there's actually more options that work at the spleen level, uh, the sick inhibitors. These are like an ongoing, um, there's ongoing trials on them, PTK inhibitors. So I think for for like the purpose of our talk or for us internists, we just need to know about the existence of these options, probably not going to be using them, but we'll see our pa some patients on them. Um, so I hope that was not too crazy of a slide. And next question or next uh, myth and fact question. So patient with drug induced ITP, you stop the medication and give them steroids. Is this a myth or a fact? Okay, so I have equal uh, answers, 53% for myth, 47% for a fact. So this is actually a myth and it's a bit of a tricky question because technically you do stop you do stop the medication and that's the, this part is correct, but you, the steroids don't always work. So basically how you manage drug-induced thrombocytopenia, and this is actually what you're probably gonna see in the hospital. Uh, you stop the drug, don't forget to add it to their allergy list, if pharmacy don't tell you to do that <laughs> yet. Uh, you do transfuse them with platelet if they're less than 10 or they're bleeding. Uh, steroid and IV uh, IG, uh, you don't use them You don't use them as first, first go-to approach, but some patient might end up getting them if they have a severe life-threatening uh, case, or if your diagnosis is not very clear, you're still thinking that they might have primary ITP. Uh, and in these patients, you should see an improvement in their platelet count within actually one to two days of stopping the drug, because again, platelets don't live that long, so there will always be production. If you're not seeing this improvement within you know very few days, then you reconsider your diagnosis. And uh, yeah, remember this mechanism of the uh, drug-induced ITP is actually antibody-mediated, not bone marrow suppression-related. Okay, so our next question. So 35 patients presented to the ED with purpura, and you found out that they have platelet of three, and they need transfusion because their platelets are less than five. Is this a myth or a fact? Okay, so I have 21% for a myth and 79% for a fact. Are you guys ready? So the answer is, I actually don't know. <laughs> I, I could not find enough evidence on this. And I'm gonna go over what I found so what I found on this, but um I think we have really no clear cut. So what I found is there's this study, uh basically your goal from giving platelets is just raising the platelet count to a safe level where you know your patient is not gonna bleed. And there's this interesting study that said. Okay, and these ITP patients, we have an uh, MRI modality that can look at their occult cerebral microbleeding and uh, see at what level they're having these findings on imaging. And then we looked at their ITP patient. I'm just going to refer to this graph here. So they have their um, platelet count on the X, their patient numbers on the Y axis. And then they looked at the finding and they found out when the platelet count between zero to four, the number of this uh, cerebral microplease is around 25 or was seen as around 25 patients or 
around 60% of patients. And then and a platelet count five to nine, less patient around 25 and 10 to 14, nine. And then above 15, there was none of these micro, uh, of this micro pleats. And then when I looked at that, of the, at this, I was like, oh, then everyone need to be transfused. So I'm not quite sure what the association between the micro bleeding finding and actually having a significant bleed or what's its, you know, long-term prognostication. Um, so that's a caveat there. And then I looked at the guidelines and what they said. And what I found is basically, basically there was one large study done on hospitalized patient and looked at how their outcome after transfusion. And they noticed that there was no association with in hospital mortality, but it lengthened their stay. So people who got transfusion stayed at the hospital longer, basically. However, when I looked at the guideline, I noticed that AAPP, ASCO, and Semethi have both no recommendation about this. So basically, they just said nothing about it. <laughs> and then there is the British uh, Society of Hematology. They recommended against another society that I did not include here also recommended against. So my take on this is actually, I don't know, I probably be asking hematology for this every time, but when I'm hematologists are probably looking at the patient clinical status and I've seen it in the worst I've seen hematologists looking at like what the extent of their echomeriosis or purpura they're having a lot of like gum bleeding or something like that and if they or if they need to be on anticoagulation then this may play in but there is no clear cut and I'm sorry that I could not answer this question which probably comes up a lot uh so I'm gonna move to my next myth and fact I um just to let you know, we're at 9.45. Uh, is this your last case or do you have yeah. many more? No, this is the last one. Great. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So this uh, myth and fact case, ITP patient need, uh, uh, if your ITP patient need a, a central catheter, your platelet must be above 50. This is a myth or a fact? Okay, 79% for a myth and 21% for a fact. Okay, so the reality or the truth is this is a myth. And I found a very interesting table in my opinion, because I think this comes up a lot. And this table goes over the general transfusion threshold for procedures. It's based on guidelines. Now, these guidelines, not necessarily based on actual clinical trials and data. It could be just experts' opinion, but it basically refers to the num the threshold number that you can use for each procedure. I'm just gonna highlight the being a central line placement. And most guidelines say more than 20. I mean, there is the, uh, I think this is the Italian guidelines, says, says above 50, but I guess with four guidelines saying 20 and living in America, we can go with the 20. Uh, lumbar puncture has a higher high, has a higher number for uh, of 50 for uh, for uh, for platelet threshold before you go on and do procedure. Uh, Non-neurosurgical procedure are above 50 and then it's higher for neurosurgery. And it's usually neurosurgical procedure are usually by neurosurgeon's preference, what I've seen. Uh, so that's that. And again, look at the immunothrombocytopy and no recommendations. Okay, so I'm gonna end up with my take home points. First of all, I hope that was helpful and I hope it was not too fast. I tend to speak fast, so. Uh, so your most common causes of thrombocytopenia in your inpatient include pseudothrombocytopenia and drug-induced thrombocytopenia. Important to remember these. When you look at the blood smear, you should look at you should look at the blood smear at the initial study to diagnose thrombocytopenia. Treat ITP for platelet count less than twenty. Expect response in two to four days. Give multiple treatment options now available for ITP and more to come on the way. Uh, there isn't enough data on platelet transfusion in ITP patients. So use your best judgment and consultants. Uh, platelet above 20 are safe for most small procedures. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you everyone for listening. This is my baby girl not listening. Uh, and I wanna thank Dr. Keel for her help with the presentation. Shout out to the hematology service at UW. It was really helpful for me to learn about platelets. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you.